Welcome to the Twilight School, everyone. Put up your hand if tonight is the first time you've ever been here. Fantastic. Great to have you. I was hoping about 20,000 hands would go up, but I was wrong. The Salesian staff are all sitting over there because they're all a little bit kind of... Um, they're all hungry and they like each other. It's a good sign that teachers in the same school like each other. Buonasera. I'm saying that because... Um, James Button speaks better Italian than I do, and your beautiful wife does as well, so I'm very ashamed. But Slamat Malam, if you've recently been to Lombok, where I've been, and Sulawesi, as you can tell from the attire. Welcome to the Twilight School. This is my little Jesuit routine. Turn around to someone you don't know, shake hands, and tell them in 15 seconds why you've come tonight. Shake hands with someone you don't know. You're having fun, aren't you? <laughs> Next time you're on a train, try that with someone you don't know and see the effect as it ripples down the, the whole carriageway. Welcome back, everyone. Notice the teachers are the least attentive and yet they're the ones demanding attention all the time. Hello, George. Welcome. Gerald. Nice to see you all. You all know this, but I might just tell you just once more. The Twilight School is a rollicking, rolling caravan of events and discussions and workshops and short courses and public forums hosted by Salesian College. James Button actually thought he was coming to VU and he'd been here about 15 years ago. So it's the other side of the main highway, James, but I'm glad you still made it to Sunbury. On this wonderful stage, you probably some of you have heard Michael Lunig, Alice Pung, Raymond Gator, Tony Birch, Elsa Piper, Barry Garner, John Marsden, John Harms, Gideon Haig, Arnold Zabel. That's a bit of a who's who. I didn't realise that we'd kind of got that list until I actually wrote all the names down. Could you give them all a round of applause? <laughs> but tonight is not about them. Tonight I'm spitting into the microphone. I'm a bit excited, James. Tonight is about journalist, editor, speechwriter and author of the beautiful book Speechless, A Year in My Father's Business, Mr James Button. Could you give him a round of applause? Break the tension. James has not time to come on stage yet, just yet. But before I've introduced James more formally and more expansively, could I please welcome to the stage my friend and colleague, and Daniel is getting married in about a week's time too, Daniel is the man who provided the initiating spark and the concept to this Good Man Project series and is a co-collaborator on all we do here. Could you please give him a warm Rupert's welcome, Mr Daniel Walsh. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you all um, very much for coming. Um, initially, this stemmed from a conversation around what does it mean to be a good man and it's branched out from there um, around a variety of contexts and themes, but the central point to all of it is conversation. No one at these nights is telling anyone how to live or what to do, it's a two-way exchange, which is, I think, where the best teaching and learning happens. Um, thank you. We've called these nights quiet, quiet acts of rebellion. Um, I think there's a, a image that's sometimes painted that the suburbs are just a homogenous blob somewhere outside of the inner city and nothing happens there, but of course it's where we live our lives and fall in love and engage with art and beauty and all sorts of things that sometimes is lost in a city-centric kind of view of the world. So thank you, I celebrate your attendance here. It's really important and um, vital. Excuse me. Okay, um, thank you James for joining us. Um, his novel Year in My Father's Business is a result of growing up in a political family, a working life in journalism and an invitation to write speeches for Kevin Rudd amongst other things. Um, it covers the intimate relationship between politics and journalism. James Button talks about the important themes because they matter more than the disposable nature of contemporary politics would have us believe. He refers to speech writing as the searching for feeling that had to be conjured out of abstractions. A professional and articulate observer that notes politics seems thin and barren, yet you meet people with skill and conviction that sometimes fall short for the most human of reasons. He watches the world and comments on it from a unique and deeply human place and we get a chance to engage in some of that tonight. So thank you for coming and thank you guys for being here.
Mr. Daniel Walsh, could you please welcome the stage, Mr. James Button. You came up the stairs, James, and you take a seat. There's water there too. Ooh. James, just to add on to what Daniel's already just said, um, Bob Ellis writing a review of your book um, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, was early last year. Bob Ellis said this in his review in the last paragraph. Few more loving books have been written by a son of a father. Few more searching books on civil processes, our lawmaking, our public discourse, or the words we, t or the, or the words we tell our big stories in. This is a quiet masterpiece and should be savoured. James Button, you've been out to Sumbri a few times and it's kind of lovely that you've come by train again. Tell us about your connection to this place. Oh, hey, thank you, Bruno, and thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. Really excited. Uh, Twilight School, not Twilight Zone. <laughs> I was a bit alarmed when you said Twilight. It's... Um, uh, my connection is Sunbury. I've been here once before and we, we did it in a lunatic asylum, didn't we, Bruno? Yeah, is that the old, old VU campus. The yeah. old VU campus, yeah. And that is also a, um, it was a beautiful old place. I've never been in this building, I don't think, before, so I'm really pleased to be here and wouldn't mind to look around later if it's possible. Absolutely. Yep. You were an editor of The Age at that time, weren't you? And uh, yes, I was. You were. I think yeah, you were running the features page and stuff like probably. that. Mm. Um, and I came up on the train. I love going on the train. The great thing about the train um, is, and I catch the train off and into the city from where I live, is that the train goes through the backs of places. So when you're, when you're in the train, you look into people's backyards and into the backyards of buildings and car lots. And you actually, um, if you catch a tram or, or drive a car, you see the world as people would like you to see it, like the front of their houses and the fronts of their shops. And it's all done up in a kind of nice way for, you know, to be, to be sellable to the world. But the backyard is what it's really like, you know, the stinky toilet and the, the mangy dog. And, and uh, the cactus and the, and the cactus. And so I, I love, you know, it's like, I feel like a voyeur on a train because you get to peer right into people. So is that important life. to have a bit of a train ride out? You're about to go yeah. to a place, you're about to engage with people. They're demanding that you pull some fairly deep kind of ideas out of, out of, Somewhere. Well, let's not yeah. get too... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've come here with false pretenses. <laughs> um, Wherever ideas come yeah, from. That's yeah. right. But seriously, is that, is that a lovely kind of prelude to, to get ready for a, a public discussion like this? Yeah, I, I think so. The great thing about a train is that you're just sitting there and you're with other people, but you're, you're with them and you're not with them. Um, but you get... I think... Mick, are you here? Uh, yeah, I was on the train with Mick, though, though we didn't know it. You know? But I, I saw him. It's interesting. I just... Uh, I just I, I, Mick is Dan's brother, and I just I just noticed you getting off the station, and I probably noticed you because you looked at me. You know, one of those things that happens on trains, and and then Dan said, "This is Mick." You know, it's just one of those little little moments. But on a train, you can sit and prepare, whereas if you're driving, you're thinking about, "Am I going to take the right road?" And uh, this is the act of driving. And uh, look, I could go. I'm I'm not a train spotter, you know, but I, I do love the the, uh, um, the the experience of going through, rushing through country or the suburbs in a train is fantastic. The, the crowd that was up on the hill there who used to come and, and listen to you, and I think you'd been out about three times, James, you've probably forgotten that. I remember you giving your kind of spiel about editing and writing at that time. I was really struck by the fact that, you know, about 70% of the way in you said, enough about me, and you actually asked to be introduced to the whole room. I thought it was a lovely gesture. I thought it was... Well, let's do that right now. Why don't yeah. we do that right well, now? Well, I think okay. it might take us all night, but all right, we, might, right. we might do that a bit later. Okay, right. But people are going to ask questions, and we're going to make okay. this really interactive All right, too. good. That, that would be great. So I was really struck by that. And the other thing that's really struck me about you as an editor is that I actually wrote a piece about South Melbourne making the grand final two years in a row, and I wrote this really emotional piece, and I sent it to you, and, and you actually set me a page and a half of really exquisite comments that would have improved the piece to no end. And I thought, how does this man who's, who's got all this stuff happening, and there was some really serious political stuff happening at the time, you seem to make time for that, and I think that said something really wonderful about you. And I think that's the kind of gentleness that struck our audience too. I think that was meant to be part of my introduction too. I guess that's something about... Uh, I was an editor on the opinion page of The Age and also the features page, and I get a lot of unsolicited submi um, submissions to me, and, and some of them were terrific. You know, and I, in fact, uh, some people who I actually published 
um, are now working as full-time journalists, in, and, and that's something I'm proud of. Uh, but you get this um, piece from someone, a member of the public, and you think, well, they've, they've put so much effort into this piece. And, you know, though I'm sort of... It, it's, it's a kind of... Um, it's, a, it's a weight on my time. No, nevertheless, I feel like I, I owe them the... Uh, the respect of um, actually giving them feedback on the piece, even if the feedback is negative, even if I'm, I'm not going to publish it, to say why I'm not going to publish it or, or what's good about the piece, what, what could be improved. But, but it does writers take never hear back. They write and they no, put they stuff don't. out, don't they? they don't. And, so and that fair, highlights the exquisite of that kind of gesture, doesn't it? Well, you know what I mean? A lot of editors get a lot of stuff and it's yeah. hard to, them to respond to. to the, the New Yorker doesn't accept unsolicited manuscripts. Sure. Like, sure. Even if it's brilliant, they, w they won't even open it. They just throw it straight out. Tell us about what got you into journalism. Give us a sense of the, the kid you were at school, what you hankered to write the teachers who kind of stirred a love of storytelling and why journalism might be a noble profession? No, that's a good question. Um, so when I was a kid, at some point I decided I was going to be a really famous, world-changing novelist, you know. And I, I don't think... I just read all the time and I didn't really... Um, I, I basically loved um, books and music and sport. You know, that's, that's what I loved. And... I was never going to be a musician, and I was I was only average at sport, you know. So um, uh, I loved writing, and I and uh, and and I read all the time, and so uh, and I guess I. Um, you were an introspective kind of kid. Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way, I yeah. was interested. Did you read under the desk while the boring teachers were uh, kind of doing that? Did I that? do that? I I I, I might have done that. I um I, I read a lot. You know, I read a lot, and. Uh, um, but who was the teacher that said, that recognised whatever talent you had and, and perhaps nurtured that in mm. some way? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I had that specific okay. teacher. Um, uh, I can think of, uh, of individuals, but I, I, the thing that was sort of crucial for me was that I went to Melbourne Uni and did an arts degree at Melbourne Uni and... Uh, and, you know, like, I, I kept a diary for years. I've got, I've got all my old diaries going back really? to when I was 16. It's, yeah. it's cringe, cringe making to read them, you know. But uh, I'm really glad I've, I've got them. And uh, so you I... you read them at all? Yeah, I do sometimes, yeah. Uh, well, every, every, you know, five years I might look at them. But um, I, I got elected uh, as editor of Farago, which, was this, which still is the student newspaper at Melbourne University and uh, with a, a couple of women. And uh, we, we got... Elected, and that was very exciting. Getting elected like that—that that really spoke to the political impulse in me. You know, going out and kind of making all these promises to people, sometimes being a little bit uneasy that maybe you can't keep all these promises, but making the promises all the same. You know, and feeling the kind of excitement of running. So you have to get elected as Farago editor. We got elected, and and um, editing a newspaper was so exciting. I just and we put. We'd lay the newspaper out on Thursday night and then we'd drive to Shepparton to get it printed. You know, it's an old world, you know. Um, at McPherson's, there's a um, famous printing family in Shepparton called McPherson and they would print it and then we'd bring it back to Melbourne. You know, we'd bring the, you know, or they'd come back on the trucks but we'd come back. And, and I started writing a lot in that time and I wrote a lot of journalism for Farago and that got me really excited about journalism. So I still wanted to be a novelist but, but I realised that A, I wasn't, you know, sort of able to do that, certainly not at that point, and secondly, um, I needed to get a job. So, so you were writing edge. this journalism, but no one had mentored you in it. You were just kind of um, doing it. Yeah, I, 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 um, were there more senior people on I, the on the paper and I, stuff? I like had that? mentors later in life. When okay. I got to the age like Martin Flanagan, sure. who's I think sure. been here, was a real mentor of me. Michael Gawenda, sure. who was the editor of the but age. But that early stuff. Where, where did you hmm. learn the art of first? reporting on what was happening in the world and and what did you know about how to do that there's the world in all its chaos mm. and complications and a million mm. things going on what do you pay attention to and what's worthy of being paid yeah, attention that's a, to that's a really good question I I'm just on the first point I think um, I, I read this writers say this all the time if you want to be a good writer you've got to read and read and read and and observe how people do things, you know, and see. And when they do something well, think how do they how do they do that, you know? And I, I often now, if when I come across, then the great thing about really good writing is it lifts your horizons up. You go, oh, that's the big thing, you know, that's the deep thing, you know. It's not just the trivial thing because we're all beset by trivia all the time. And so, um, but how do you know when you're onto the big thing? Uh, 
Is there some Geiger counter and you're going, beep, 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 mm. this is it? Um, you know, the older I get, we're sort of jumping around here, but the older I get, uh, you know, when you get older, I'm, I'm past 50 now and I, I can see how much time I've got left. You know, I don't know how much time I've got left, but it's, it's sort of clear that it's not, you know, going to be... I'm and, 61, and was, be careful you know, where you go. And, yeah, no, no, but, and, and so uh, you think about, well, you know, everything, and the, of course there's a downside to that, but the upside is that everything takes on much greater significance. And, and, and when you're thinking, a lot of trivia starts to fall away and you think, focus on this stuff. And I can feel, like I would like to go full-time writing at some point, and I can feel that, um, I, I, I hope that, that I'll, I'll be much better equipped to just go straight to the, really serious stuff rather than, rather than mucking around. That said, I, I've just been reading a book called um, What I Saw, and it's by um, a, a journalist in Berlin in the 1920s called Joseph Roth. And it's just a, he, he wrote these things called feuilleton, which were just pieces of writing that he wrote really fast. And he's describing Berlin during the period of the Weimar Republic, before the Nazis, after World War I. And the place was riot and chaos and you know, all the th- sort of the cabaret, Christopher Isherwood. World and he just he writes this fantastic piece at the start where he says um, he he basically goes out in the street one day and he describes all the things he sees the man selling ice cream you know the the organ grinder with a monkey the girl who who looks lost the guy selling oranges and and so on and, and so forth and and he says the the sensations that I'm having now are more important than the biggest issues biggest political issues in the world, you know? And it's, it's a really important point that he's making about perceiving huge things in the small things. Mm. Yeah, and uh, uh, that, that in any encounter, um, uh, you know, there, the, there, there's the potential, and, and, and he lived at moment for, you know, for, for a deep thought to happen or, to, or, or a connection to happen. Yeah. Helen Garner recently published excerpts from her diary and they were just exquisitely beautiful yeah. still. Yeah. And they were just these little short excerpts. You know, I was just thinking of you maybe Did she publish that in a newspaper? Just or? in the monthly or something Did more she? recently. Okay. Right. And I, I thought, said, we'll look out yeah, for it. Yeah. yeah. And she'd started as a journal, mm. as a, a diary writer too. Mm. The yeah, she still Tell us about diary. the importance of that and writing letters and, mm. and, and, and trying whatever means you have mm. in which to try and capture what it is that you know about the world. Why is that important? And... So the thing about keeping a diary, I think the use about keeping a diary is it reminds you what you were doing at that, at that time. I'm not, for many years I thought I'll make all these notes in a diary and one day I'll put them all into a book, you know, into a novel. And that's completely uh, ridiculous you know, because you can't just sort of cut and paste things out. And, and, but the, uh, a diary gives you a sense of, of what was going on in your life at a, at a moment and how you were feeling and, and, and how, you, how you wrote. And... Look, I think any kind of writing is like working the muscle, you know, so, so that's, that's good. And uh, um, At a deeper level, I, I, I love this Looney cartoon where this character's on this cliff top and he's got this weird contraption, it's called the understandoscope. Right. And I'm just mm. wondering if writing is your kind of understandoscope. Is, yeah, is, yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the way that his mm. square spot in the paper in which he draws his ears. Yeah, yeah. And does it lead to something... A deeper appreciation, a deeper awareness, a deeper way of living, perhaps. Is that too big a claim to make for, for writing? And no, I don't think so. I think everybody should write. I, I think there is a way in which um, writing things down on the page, provided we're honest with ourselves, um, there's a way in which writing things down on the page forces us to think about the reality of a situation far more deeply than just um, saying it. Uh, that there is actually a kind of deep connection with the reality of something through the, through writing about it, and and so and the physicality of it is there something um, about that? I don't that? know what it is. I'm not sure if it's the physicality of it, but it, but I I often think you know you go to a, um, you, you're chatting with friends and you say you know uh, I think Tony Abbott's this or that you know uh, whatever and we'll talk about him later and and. Uh, and then you, then you go to write it, and you think, well, can I justify that? You know, how do I justify that? It, it just, it's, it, as soon as you write it, it stands exposed on the page. You know, and, okay, I need evidence. You know, what's my evidence? You know, and, uh, um, you know, there's a, the, and there's, so there's something... Uh, and one of the things that I found as an editor at The Age was that one of the exciting things was that you could get... 
when people had seen things, rather than, I actually don't think opinion is very interesting all the time. What is really interesting is testimony. You know, I saw this happen. This happened at a train station. This happened, you know, to me. You know, this, this happened in, in my family. This happened. And, and people, large numbers of people were actually very good at, at writing about that when they, you just said, say what happened, you know, write, write, what happened next? What happened next? What happened next? <laughs> if you just write that in, a, in an unadorned way, you actually have got a, often a very powerful piece of, of prose. Yeah, and yet we go to all these other kind of high flutin ways yeah. and don't get yeah, the we, same yeah. thing, do we? Yeah, yeah. What did, um, Elmo Leonard said, uh, as soon as it fi- he put on his computers, as soon as it feels like writing, cut it out, you know. Helen Garner says the limitation of the page is comforting. Mm. The, the screen is endless, but the page yeah, is right. kind of... Yeah, yeah. There's something in that. Yeah, I think, think there is. There is yeah. Yeah. And you write more slowly on the page. Yeah. What has journalism done for you? Because you want to be a journalist, and I think you met Keating when he was a young politician and you were a young kid, oh, right. yeah, and yeah. he said to you, you, what do you want to be? And you yeah. said, I want to be a journalist. He said, you're going to report the news. I'm going to be making the news. Is that right? Is, well, he said, uh, so my, my dad was in politics and uh, when I was about 20, my brother Nick and I, he invited us up to Canberra and, uh, and we, um, we stayed with him up in Canberra for a few days and we went, we're having dinner in, in the old Parliament House, the beautiful old building, uh, dining room, and Paul Keating came up and he sat down with us for a while and he said, what do you want to do, Jamie? And I, I said, oh, I'm... I don't know, Paul, thinking about journalism. He said, yeah, I thought about journalism once. He said, but I decided I wanted to make history, not write about it. You know? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, he made history and, and I tried to write about it. You know? <laughs> it's sort of as, as he said, but um, he Can was very s- pleased with himself when he said that. You know, he sort of sat back and he, he, sort of, he looked like a saloon gambler who had just taken the prize. You know? and, uh, and Keating always had this kind of riverboat gambler look about him, I reckon, you know, when he was kind of... Yeah, what a clever boy am I, you know. Tell us about, in broad terms, because you've been a a foreign correspondent, haven't you, Um, which you did late. You you were an editor of The Age. Mm -hmm. You did the opinion pages. Mm -hmm. You you were the education writer. Mm -hmm. Sweep over that broadly, but what has been the great privilege that journalism has kind of brought to your life, do you think? Oh, look, I, I think the great privilege of journalism is the opportunity... Uh, to go out in the streets with a notebook and uh, <clears throat> ask people questions. And, you know, if you go out in the street with a notebook and just say, hi, can you tell me about... or go to someone's house and knock on their door. And if you say, oh, can you tell me about, um, uh, you know, what's happening in your area or, or even more really personal, intimate things, and they'll, they'll say, get the hell out of here. But if you say, I'm from the age, they'll say, come in, come in. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I... I um, you get this access to just this extraordinary diversity of life. You know. um, you, once you get that access, you have ethical obligations to treat the people you know, carefully because people often in ordinary... People who are not politicians or people in public life don't un- always understand the rules of the game. Um, they don't understand that what... They forget you're a journalist after 10 minutes of chatting and just two people chatting and they'll tell you all sorts of things that might come back to cause them extreme pain if you were to put them in, put it in the paper. So that's the thing you've got to wrestle with. Um, the other downside, I, I, I guess, the, the, other, the first thing is not a downside so much as a responsibility. The, the downside is that journalists, um, with all this wonderful access, they, they're really the watchers in the game rather than, rather than the participants. You know. They're the people on the side who are telling you how the game went, you know, what, whatever game it is, and uh, they're not the players. Even though I believe that what you write in journalism and the stories you write is actually potentially world-changing. That still, you know, we, we live in a, a world of stories and the stories you tell, are, they shape the reality of the world. But um, So when you went to speech writing, James, was that a frustration in saying, I've been observing and mm. I went into the game and, yeah. and I want to understand that world that my father... Yeah, Absolutely, that, yeah, definitely Tell us was. about the big motivations for this wonderful book. Uh, well, um, so... And what you thought you th- mm. were starting out doing and what did it end up becoming, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'd been a journalist for a very long time um, and uh, I'd been, my last job had been in London as a correspondent and uh, my father um, got very sick in the end of 2007. We came back in early 2008 um, uh, early, he, he died in April 2008 and at his funeral I, um, I, I was very, you know, kind of affected by and moved by his funeral. Uh, John Kane, the former Premier, had been an old family friend um, and I'd known John since I was like 
you know, eight, seven or eight years old, um, always Labor Party people in our house and John was one of them. You know. And John stood up and gave this eulogy and he talked about the really dog days of the ALP, you know, uh, when Labor could never get elected in Victoria. And in fact, Labor was so weak in Victoria that it actually stopped Labor getting elected federally. And it was uh, the, you know, the, the reform movement in Victoria led to the, finally led to the election of the Kane government in 82 and, and was vital in getting Whitlam elected in, in 72 because when Victoria was cleaned up, Labor was finally electable nationally. And my dad had had a role in that. He'd been a you know, reformer in the party, what they called the, one of the participants. John Kane talked about this, you know, and he talked about the, the really the long slog of reforming the ALP, you know, of making it electable, of modernising it, you know, and, and he had this belief, and John Cain had this belief, that if you could change the Labor Party, you could change the country. And that's still the case today. You know, we need to change the Labor Party um, so that we can change the country. In that sense, nothing has changed. In fact, we've sort of come full circle in some ways. Um, and I was very affected by that. I thought, well, you know, they really did something, that, those people. They really worked incredibly hard. They were never home. We never saw Dad, but, but, but he, they, they were doing good work, you know. And by contrast, what had I done? I'd done a few things as a journalist, but um, you know, I wasn't sure that it added up to that much. And uh, I remember thinking after the funeral, you know, and, and it, was a, you know, it was a great sort of Labor Party event and Keating was there and he, he said, nobody puts on a show like the Labor Party. <laughs> he said, you know, he said the other lot, because you know, it, it was a really big event, huge funeral and, you know, um, Malcolm Fraser was there and lots of, Julie Gillard and a whole bunch of ministers and just a lot of people. And, he said, the other lot, they couldn't have done this, you know. And, uh, and, and, you know, it was just, like, it was fascinating seeing him again and kind of having that encounter with politics and, and, and made, ma made me think, I'd love to sort of sure. get involved in politics. And so at the end of the year, I got an offer to go and work spe write speeches for Kevin Rudd and it really was a sort of no-brainer that I was going to yeah. do it. Mm. Can we hold that for a moment? Yeah. Just backtrack for sure. a second. Tell me about writing a eulogy for your own father. How hard is that? Is that impossibly difficult? But yeah, you did it. You're asking really good questions, Bruno. It's, uh, yeah, look, it is. The thing about a eulogy is you don't have a lot of time and you've got to put a whole life into... Um, is anyone here written a eulogy for a parent? I'm sure people have, you know, and it, it's a... You really... You, you get one chance at it. It's not like you can do it again. But you know? your father was a towering figure in the Labor Party. He was a warrior. He, he was... Deeply loved, wasn't he? Yeah, okay. I guess he was. You know, yeah. and all of that other stuff yeah. about the Labor, they were yeah. all going to be there. Yeah, that was that's another right. layer of yeah. complication. Yeah. But finding yeah. the truth of the yeah. man yeah. and condensing it yeah. into 15 minutes. Yeah, that's right. Is, is, yeah. is that doable? Well, I did it. <laughs> Whether it's doable or not, I, I, you know, it's interesting, Bryn. I, I think that, um, you know, I wanted to say some th I didn't want to give a hagiography of a eulogy, like, you know, a, a, he, he was a great man in lots of ways. He's also a difficult man, cranky bugger, you know, moody, um, could be self-absorbed, could be very focused on his work, you know. And we had a very good, good relationship, but I wanted to s state those things about him as well because I think it's more interesting uh, if, you give a, if you give a fleshed out, accurate, nuanced picture of somebody with, with a few of their warts, you know, rather than just... I, I, when I go to a funeral and I hear a hagiographic, so you know, I get a bit bored, you know, I think... Did all that experience as a journalist, was that... Oh, helpful definitely, or yeah, because, because people say mm, teachers they can talk mm, and in front of classes and they go mm, and I go I don't think so and a lot mm, of them are really shy and I don't think mm, they're good at public speaking necessarily mm, I don't think you should make that assumption mm. no I think it, what you learn as a journalist is that the most powerful thing in the world in writing is is not to make abstract statements although abstract sure. statements have their place but to tell stories yeah, sure. you know? so but I, tell us I, about I your father stories. and how, how, how did you go about it and Tell us about a little bit of the build-up yeah. and yeah. how you pin that down. Actually, look, um, it's, it's funny, you know, I, um, uh, on the Sunday, the, the, the funeral was on Tuesday and the Sunday morning I was sort of staring at my screen and um, not knowing what to, what to say and this might have helped but anyway, it's worth telling. I'd written, Michael Lunig had written to me during the week and it said... Um, and I'd something known, beautiful, didn't he, at that time oh, to you? Yeah, yes. well, um, I'd known Michael through the age and I, he'd just written, um, sending his condolences and I'd written back and said uh, something like, oh, thank you, Michael, it's a, it's a strange time, sad time or something and he said... He wrote back on the Sunday morning just as I was sitting there working out on... playing with this eulogy and he said... Um, he said, if I may, let me tell you something about this strange, sad time. He said, uh, his father had died some years earlier, and he said, in my experience, 
if the relationship between a father and a son has been good enough, then it continues after the father's death. He said, um, he said that, uh, in, he said in my own case, he said that I actually have, um, uh, I have had many uh, great experiences with my father since he died. You know, and he wasn't talking about a, a seance. You know, he was talking about the process of thinking through their relationship and coming to a resolution uh, of that relationship after his father's death. And, and he said, and he said, and he said, I'm sure it will be the same thing for you. And in fact, you have much to look forward to, your father and you. And I, I just remember that line. You know, it that's just, extraordinary. It was about four it? or five days after his death. He said, "You have much to look forward to." I wish someone and had that said that out, to me. It turned yeah. out to be quite prophetic, I think. Anyway, it had an impact on me on the day. Your eulogy doesn't talk about your brother who, who committed suicide, no. didn't? It? And you anguished over that, yeah, didn't that was, you? That was a mistake in hindsight. Tell yeah. us how that was pointed out to you, and tell yeah. us. Mm. Is the book in part that, that posthumous attempt to still understand your father, to still continue that relationship? Yeah, Perhaps? Uh, I'm not trying much. to get deeply psychological oh, here. No, but no. So, no. so a bit of context. Um, uh, when I was 20 in 1982, I had a, um, my younger brother David, I have two younger brothers, my younger brother David, who, who was 15 months younger than me, died of a heroin overdose. And it was a... Um, uh, as you would expect, it was a catastrophic time for my family. And uh, ten months after David died, um, two things happened. My, my parents divorced and uh, my, the Hawke government was elected and, and Dad went into politics as a minister for the first time. So, so the thing that he had been waiting for all his working life, which was to become a minister that he aspired to in a Labor government, had finally come to pass. And yet he was completely destroyed as a person in that time. Um, in fact, my parents' divorce kind of ended up quite well. They stayed very good friends. Did, yeah. yeah, they did. Yeah, and so that, that 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 was a good thing. But I remember it as being an extremely painful time. So he he became a minister, and then he spent the next um, ten years as a minister, uh, working incredibly hard, and he did the job well. Um, it was a successful government. Uh, but he had this incredible um, burden that he carried that he didn't really talk about with, with anybody. And, uh, and, and frankly, he and I failed to... Dis we talked about it from time to time, but, but never in a, in a way that really connected. Were you aware of the burden and how heavily it weighed I, upon I, you? I was, but I became... Yes, I was. Of course I was. How could I not be? Uh, but, uh, but it was difficult to discuss it with him. And, and I never found a way to talk talk about it with him and in the period leading up to his death uh, which was a very difficult time he had uh, pancreatic cancer he was extremely sick he didn't want to die he was angry about about dying um, he didn't talk about David at all in that time and uh, uh, so and, and I th and I remember thinking as he was dying what's the point of raising this now you know this this terrible event that happened a long time ago in a way, I carried that sense of not talking about it I into his funeral, you know, and uh, and I didn't raise uh, David in my um, in in my eulogy. And uh, a few days after the funeral, I sent the eulogy to a friend of mine who lives in Spain, Rod. And and Rod had actually uh, lost the stepson; his, his wife's son had committed suicide, and, and, and uh, had committed suicide. Yeah, um, and. Uh, um, and so he, he had a very deep sense of, of kind of loss and grief himself. And when I sent the eulogy to him, he said, it's good, I like it. He said, but I just wonder why you didn't mention David. And, and I remember feeling absolutely appalled when I, when I read that email. I thought, my God, I, I have attempted to describe my father's life and I've left out this absolutely defining event. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and so, yes, I, I, I spent a lot of... Uh, was the, the book, book in part a response well, to that? Well, it wasn't intended to It wasn't be. intended No. To. In fact, yeah. the whole writing about David and, and Dad wasn't even the, the in, in my mind at the start of writing the book. Great. And, and no thought to do that. So what was the intention behind writing the book? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Like, I, I literally didn't start the was idea it, of writing I've, the book. I've been a speechwriter for Rudd for a year and sort this of, didn't turn out. And yeah, that. There was that. And, and there was a, a sense, look, if I'm to be brutally honest with myself, I, I, I think there was a sense that I had had a fascinating experience and there was a book in it, you know. It's as simple as that, you know. And, uh, but... But as soon as I went into that, I realised that that actually uh, that triggered a whole bunch of 
you know, a lot of different questions that, you know, would not just be easily resolved. So the book that it becomes yeah, is vastly cha- different changes. from the notion of what you thought was going to yeah, be. That's, and that's that exactly be surprising. right. Yeah. It's which, an unusual which is a process that just took its own course almost, yeah. you know, without my, without my intending. Because it's part memoir. You talk about your childhood, don't yeah. you? You talk about the Labor Party and all those characters, the Moscasses, and, yep. and you give an analysis of the Labor Party. Yep. You, you end up in the public service and you write about the public service. And I thought, well... You know, let's watch paint dry. That's more exciting. But you, you come up with a view that says these people are decent people who are, who are doing nation-building kind of things and they're putting up these documents which often aren't going to be kind of acknowledged or even accepted and they'll put all this... and they'll keep doing it consistently. So you saw something kind of quietly noble in what oh, they did. Oh, quietly noble. So your book's about well that. Put. And yeah. then it's about your father as yep. well, isn't yep. it? Yeah, That's it a strange conglomeration yeah, in one sense, of, isn't uh, it? It's... Um, uh, John Cain launched it in Melbourne. Yeah. And he said it's four books, not one. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Did you realise you were going into four books as you were starting to write that? Did uh, you feel it kind of pulling in these four y- major ways? Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. I mean, if if I um, if I did it again, I'd do it differently, mm-hmm. um, and I'd tie some of the themes together. I th- and I think they can be tied together. But um, but there, you know, I think there's there's connections in the book. Maxim Gorky says truth has no pity at the start of his autobiography. Exactly. Yeah. Do we have to be ruthlessly honest? You, you take us into the grief of your father, the grief, your own grief. Mm. You expose your family's grief in a really public way. Yeah, I do. I do. And that, that's I, hard stuff. Yeah. I said to Raymond Gator, why do you write about Romulus? And go, he says, I don't know. And he's been writing about him for 20 years. Mm. We don't really understand these things, do we, in some ways, do you think? I, I, you know, maybe there's a kind of faith that if you, um, I, I think certainly in my own case, there's a faith that if you go right to the, I'm thinking about my father actually in this case, if you go right to the truth of it, it actually won't hurt. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I learned so much from doing it, Bruno. Just yeah. writing Tell that story. Tell me what you learned. So what I learned about yourself too. Yeah, yeah. What I learned um, was, and I literally learned it as I was tapping. I remember one day I was tapping at the computer, um, and I was writing a section about David and and about Dad's response to David. And, and I realised at one point that that I had had a lot of feelings of remorse myself about David for many years. And, and had felt, as you do when you lose a sibling in that situation, I'd felt responsible. I had felt, uh, you know, that I hadn't treated, as an older brother, I hadn't treated him as well as I might have. Because you ragged him and razzed I him. I ragged him and razzed him and, and uh, you know, um, uh, used whatever advantage I could over him, you know, I was an older brother. Um, and for, as, as, a, as a, a, a girlfriend of mine at the time said, my sister did that to me. But I didn't die, you know, and th- that was the difference. And uh, so my relationship was with David was frozen at that point that he died. Yeah. Um, and I, I realised writing that if I had done the thing that I never did, which was to actually express to my father my own feelings of remorse and ugliness about this event, that that might have unlocked something for him. Whereas what I tended to do was just say, "Dad, I'm really sorry you feel like this," and it's, you know, and and he and he, you know, and, and that didn't unlock anything for him, you know. So so had I had I been able to unlock this, I, I might have actually been able to help him talk about this thing that he could never talk about. That he would talk about. He had a terrific partner, Joan, in the last ten years of his life, and t- twice a year he would get very drunk. He drank, wouldn't yeah, he? And, and he would break down and sob uncontrollably and and, and talk about it. Um, and so, I, and so, I realised in writing this book that he'd carried this all his life. You know, this that, that if you get drunk twice a year, and and then it's with you all the time. You know, and uh, and and I had this great. You know, so I remember actually. Oh my God! Oh my God! You know, as so I was. You know, and and I had that sense of both, uh, kind of the thrill of the revelation of that. And incredible sadness at the same time, and the sadness, of course, was that he was dead, and and that I couldn't, uh, you know, the understanding was sort of useless in that sense in terms of my relationship with my father, uh, but you know, the philosopher said life is lived forward and understood backward, backwards, you know, yeah. and and it, and so often, and in 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 a sense, if he was still alive, I probably wouldn't have arrived at that understanding, you know, because he was would have been there as the kind of force in my life, and I wouldn't have probably written the book, so. 
you know, maybe it was always to be that I would understand it too late. Sometimes we understand things in life too late. And in life he was a towering figure. Even his grief was large, I get a sense from oh. your book. Is that oh, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. So when, when he was what down, do you do with your grief when he was down, we were all down. Grief. Everybody, yeah. you know, yeah. everyone watching, you know, if, he, if my father was down, if he was in one of his moods, we would all sort of take that on. Mm. What do you know about being a bloke and being a man from that experience and, and the way you now father James and mm. and is it are we a generation that fathers better because we, we have an understanding we grew up with feminism or, or, or are we just going to botch it in our own way and and it's just such a difficult thing to get right it's hard to generalize Bruno yeah. I think um, because uh, I think that there are there really great ways in which men have a privilege to have yeah. access to um, to their children in a way that yeah. they either didn't, weren't able to take or didn't take sure. in the past. Uh, so that's the upside. Um, uh, the downside is that uh, we don't have as many kids as, as, the, as we used to have. So the kids that we have are probably too, f too watched and focused sure. on and look, sure. looked at. People wor work too hard. People work too hard. And, so and you do you know. too, don't you? No, I don't work. No? No, no okay. I don't. Yeah, Sorry, I, I, I thought I, you yeah, did. Yeah, I'm really, I, I've I got did that. my research. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. I've um, had such trouble getting yeah, you here. Yeah. So I just <laughs> right, assumed yeah. you work oh, so hard. Yeah, yeah. Look, okay, okay. There but that balance between the public mm. and the private, mm. your dad and those mm. warriors in the Labor Party mm. who believed in, in that common good and working mm. towards that and who gave over mm. to that, Mm. Their family suffered. Yeah, and so you missed I, out, didn't you? In yeah, some ways, yeah, I did. And then we, when I was a kid, I was angry with my father. Like I was angry, he wasn't around much. Um, he left my mum uh, once, and he came back, and then he left again, sure. and he remarried, and and, I, and you know, like like. So kids, you so conscious of getting that balance right for yourself as a dad? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think so. I, I I think I made a pact that I once I had kids, I would never ever leave. You know, and I'm not trying to say I'm noble in doing that, but I just I couldn't bear the the pain of seeing a kid left, you know, I just, it's one of those things that, you know, um, and, and I, look, I know people have divorced, the kids are really happy, you know, sure. it's fine, it's not, sure. it's, there's no rule here, but it's just for myself, I, I just couldn't, uh, I knew a guy who had um, had a kid very young, and she'd grown up, you know, and she was fine, but he sort of, uh, he felt like a ghost to me somehow, he'd never kind of reconnected with his daughter, and yet he had this, you know, and, um, so... Um, you know, I used to think when I was a kid of that um, Paul Simon song about slip sliding away. Mm. Said, the father had a son, he longed to yeah. tell him all the reasons. For, I used to think about, about my mm. dad with this, you know. He used to long to tell him all the reasons for the things he'd done and came a long way just to explain, kissed his boy as he lay sleeping mm. and turned around and headed home again, you know. That thing of not being able to talk, mm. you know, and just but wanting to convey feeling. I mean, a lot of blokes are like that, I think. In your book, there's a beautiful scene of you've all been out with your dad, you've been to the footy, he loved the Geelong footy club, he was revered there too, wasn't he? You'd sent a game and Geelong had just come good late that season and he'd drawn on a big newspaper the yeah. team that he thought was going to get him to a grand final. Yeah. Yeah. And then you all go and you've had a wine together and you've mm. been drinking whiskey yeah. and your dad's standing at the gate, yeah. isn't yeah. he? And yeah. He just kept standing there. Yeah, I kept turning back. I'd walk another hundred yards down the road and yeah. I'd turn back and he was still standing. And you told that story in the funeral, didn't you? Yeah, I did you? tell that story. Yeah. It, it seems like a micro story, but there's mm. something in that. What, what's that about? Well, the, I think it's the wordlessness, you know, of uh, if you're a very articulate man, you know, who, who lived in politics as a word game. You yeah. know, you, you and went, he was good at that, wasn't and, he? And he, he was good at it. And down. he wrote books yeah. and uh, he, w he was good at it. But, but he had speechlessness, you know, and... Uh, in a sense, that became the kind of understory of the book, you know, was that thing yeah. of not being able to say, to say things. And uh, so that, that story of him standing at the gate was both a wordlessness in him, but a lot of feeling in him as well. And he really yeah. loved, he really loved his kids, yeah. you know, he really loved us. And so um, uh, th 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 I, th I think that story resonated with people because they sort of knew him as b a bit like that, you know, people, people recognise Do you think we all people. understand our parents after they're gone in a deeper way? I know that's uh, connecting. Yeah, I think a lot of anyway. people do say, you know, they come and I, and I think a lot of men come to forgive their fathers yeah. a lot more later in life when they kind of see what they're, you know, I think a lot of young men are angry with yeah. their dads. I, um, I, I uh, had a conversation with a senior Labor person once and he had lost his father when he was 20. And he said, I've got a lot of anger about that, you know. And, and, and he said, and I, this guy um, had anger, you know, he was angry, mm. you know. And, uh, and I thought maybe if he'd got 20 more years, or in my case, 25 more years, that wouldn't be the case because mm. I don't have any mm. anger. But I think if you lose, your, lose a father in early age, I think it's, it's, mm. it's hard, it's hard. 
I gave a eulogy at my father's funeral too. Mm. I think I understood him in that 15 minutes better than I had really? in his, you know. How old was, was, your, how old about, was your father? It was about, big, he was 90. And, and you I, were how old? I was 55. Okay, you know right. I mean? But just that idea of going, I've got to get this right. I've got to tell the truth here. I've got to try and condense it into 15 minutes. What am I going to say? Mm. Five o'clock in the morning, mm. you've got no idea. And the people are going to be there at 11. You're going, I can't get this together. Yeah. And it came. You know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. don't want to go on about that. No, no, but, but that it's... sense of understanding mm. it and realising that in uttering certain words, mm. something was mm. understood and yeah. felt and transmitted. Yeah, and, and, and you can, the great discipline of a 15-minute or 20-minute speech. I mean, Ronald Reagan said that you can say anything in 20 minutes, you know. Anything at all. Yeah. You know, no speech should ever go past 20 minutes, yeah. he said, because people lose interest. You know. yeah. um, but, but you can, and you obviously did sure. that. Men and grief. The feminists tell mm. us we're not good at this kind mm. of stuff and that, but your book is a lot about grief, isn't it? Yeah. Your book is a lot about love. It's yeah. about fathers and sons and stuff like that. Uh, don't necessarily have to buy that. You no, mean, no, because I don't I, buy I, you know, no, I Not you, but I, you know, there are different ways of grieving and maybe yeah. men have a different way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you understand yeah. a bit more about those mechanisms within you, not mechanisms, but do you understand a bit more? Yeah, Are definitely. you more expressive about grief now after, um, after the book and after what you've understood about your dad? And well, all gr that grief's one of those things you hope to avoid you know, as, as much as possible, so I, I, I guess I'm yet to be tested about that, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, yeah, I would hope so. I yeah. would hope so. Yeah. Mm. We're going to throw to the audience because I've gone about 25 minutes longer than I said I was going to, but I just love talking to you so much, James. Just give James a round of applause for all of that. Thanks, Brian. Let him get a drink of water. Daniel's going to roam the floor, and Daniel's probably got a question too. Do you want to take that one off? Then, or we'll share. Bruno, I can share. Yeah. It's fine. Do we want to? Is there anyone with something burning in there? I might. I've got a, a quick one. Um, Don Watson, who's a, a speechwriter for, um, who was a speechwriter for Paul Keating, said recently that great speeches took words and ideas seriously. Yep. Funnily enough, not many in politics do anymore. Um, and he goes on to say they're almost trying to make words as dull as possible. Okay, can you repeat that bit, Dan? You said the, yeah. the poli that's just um, from the top, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> Don Watson, blah, 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 blah. Paul Keating said recently that great speeches took words and ideas seriously. Funnily enough, not many in politics do anymore. And he goes on to elaborate and say they almost try to make words as dull and meaningless oh, as possible. Yeah. So I just wondered what your reflection on that mm. was. Yeah. Oh, it's a very complex area, but it's certainly right. I agree with it. Um, Keating said that uh, the speech is the great... It's a great noble form of public life because it forces you to argue and to reason and persuade, um, and you, you have the, at the doorstop or the, you know, the uh, the, the soundbite or the the media interview, um, which is just this you know just very quick thing. Whereas a speech actually forces you to develop an argument. Um, the great thing about speeches is that when, when someone is speaking, you get the whole person, you know. You get, uh, you get their intellectual capacities. You get to get, you know, the audience gets a, a, a chance to make a judgment about, not only about their, their mind, but also about the person, you know. The, are they funny? Do they move me? You know, and, you know, everybody, everybody in this room will have given a speech, all right, at some point, you know, at a wedding or a funeral or, or a birthday party, you know, and, uh, and, and you're terribly nervous, you know, and about a week or two before the... The, the speech you're, you're hoping you'll be run over by a car and n not killed, but you know, incapacitated enough not to have to give the speech. You know? and, and yet, when you stand to give the speech, everybody in the room goes quiet and they're all sort of with you and hoping you... you know. I, I'm going off your point, Dan, but I, I think... What have we lost? Look, um, the speech is still a great form. Look at Noel Pearson's speech at, um, at, at Whitlam's, uh, at Whitlam's um, service. Uh, Gillard's... Um, a misogyny speech was a defining moment for her, you know. Um, Rudd's um, uh, apology speech is a really terrific speech. Um, is it, is it a I wish I'd written it. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it a twofold yeah. relationship whereby, it's because they're not trying to say anything, the speech writers can't say anything because they're trying to reduce everything to glib slogans and they don't actually want to stand for something because then you're held accountable for something? And great speeches come out of great actions, you know. Um, Churchill gave great speeches because it was an absolutely existential survival moment for Britain, right? They're about to be bombed, invaded. He, he was wanting to call up the, you know, what he saw as the greatness of the British people to resist um, 
to resist tyranny. Yeah, uh, Martin Luther King's um, "I Have a Dream" speech at the Washington Monument is the culmination of like you know a ten-year, but really a sort of three-hundred-year struggle for 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 African Americans to be recognised as equal people. Um, uh, uh, you don't, uh, you know, Obama go, made great speeches without the same, you know, moment of, you know, of sort of, um, w without the same sort of, you know, defining moment. But but he had a sense of a kind of mission, you know, that that was that actually got the fact that he could give great speeches got made him president. He wouldn't have been president if he wasn't a great speech maker. So I, I think I think part of the problem for politicians now is that they're timid. They're not doing a lot. Uh, they're not sure who their audience is. They're, they, they, they now are from political parties that no longer have a base in the community, so they're not sure who their people are, who they're speaking for. Um, and if you're basically planning to tweak some little policy 3%, you're not going to be able to give a great speech. Rhetoric can't cover up inaction. You know, it can't cover up. It, it's got to have something to say. That's, that's the key thing about speech making. It's got to have something to say. It doesn't actually matter if, it's, if the words are clunky, if, if, the, if the content is there. Um, um, it sounds like actions speak louder than words, yeah. but we're talking about words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, but, James. But actions yeah. speak. So actions you, do so speak. you've got to speak, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Martin's my name. I'm a local uh -huh. Sunbury person and a sometime writing student of Bruno's, yeah. which has given me a lot. Um, and you've already been very generous with your personal reflections and Bruno's grilling of you. And, but I guess one of the questions I had to start with, I'll stay with, which is about your father's legacy as you see it. And that could be public, but it also could be as you experience it in your life. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, look, I think his legacy was, uh, I, I think the reform of the Labor Party in the 60s was really important. Um, it had ramifications beyond Victoria. Um, it was about modernising the ALP. The ALP had been a party controlled by... Um, a, a, they were called the left faction, but they weren't really very left. They were a bunch of very sort of socially conservative older blokes, you know, um, who really weren't... Very, the society was changing, you know, and, and the Labor Party needed to change and it needed to open up to to, you know, non-Anglo-Irish people, to women, to a um, to whole bunch of new, new people. And I think he was part of that, of that change, um, which ushered in a very successful period for Labor and a period that is now, you know, the sort of the spirit of that time is it's now lost, really, as a party. Um, it might regain it, but it's lost it for now, I think. It's the first thing. I think the industry plans um, were important, um, very important, and... The key thing to those plans, the car plan, pharmaceuticals, steel plan, was that he actually managed to get business and unions together to solve problems in a practical way, uh, which was a hallmark of that of that government. So he wasn't ideological; he was a problem solver in that in that way. Um, and then he wrote some good books. I, he, and he always wanted to be a writer, you see. And so he sort of left his run at writing very late. But he wrote some good books and some funny books and some. Uh, you know, some insightful books, I think, about politics. Um, he, uh, he, he lived to see Geelong win a premiership, <laughs> um, which he was pleased about. <laughs> um, uh, and he, he was very, very um, sort of... He was, he, he was besotted with, with football. He loved football, you know. Um, and he loved it with him. Yeah, it was a great... And, and this, we'd, we're talking about fathers. This, it was a great... You know, football is a great way for, you know, for, for males to spend time together and, you know, without having to sort of face each other and go, you know, how are you? You know, it's all very embarrassing, you know. But you can do that. I, I remember one day we are at the footy. It was three-quarter time and, uh, and he came up to me and he said... And, like, there was... You know, they were actually leaving the huddles, you know. He said, how are you going in yourself, you know? And I thought, he's done this now because it's about 60 seconds before they're going to bounce the ball, you know? <laughs> and so we can have this moment of kind of connection, but it will end, you know? It will end soon, you know? And uh, it was... It was, it was I, I actually really loved that moment, but it was like, you know, it was, it was not sort of like sit down for three hours and let's, you know, thrash it all out. That's not the way he operated. Um, yeah, so... I'm Sue. Um, you referred to Noel Pearson's speech at mm. Goff's uh, memorial. Yep. Um, I feel like Goff going is a seismic shift, mm. but I'm not sure if that's just a personal thing. You referred to that we perhaps have come full circle. Mm. 
And there's been some beautiful speech making around Gough's death and what we've yeah. lost. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever get it back? And I know that's a very big question. It's a really good question. Um, so let me tell you, I gave this talk um, last year and uh, it was about my book. And then the first, the first guy who asked the question said, he said, tell me, why has Australia become so boring? <laughs> and I said, oh, what do you mean? He said, well, the politicians, you know, they've become so boring. He said, they, they used to be, you know, large and exciting, you know. He said, but it's not just the politicians. He said, the business leaders used to be interesting people. He said, now nah, they're really boring. He said, the sports people used to be interesting. He said, now nah, they're boring, you know. Why are we so boring, you know. And I thought, what a bloody good question. You know, I couldn't answer it. I had no idea. But I think to, uh, to come to your question, I don't know why, but there was in the past this idea of the great man, right? They were usually men, okay? So the man is important in this, you know. The go in, in, the, in, the, in the Australian political context, it was Goff, you know. It was, um, I mean, the ones I sort of relate to on the Labor side, you know, it was Keating, you know, Hawk, um, Chif, Ben Chifley, train driver, you know. And something has changed in our culture so that we're not comfortable with that idea of the great man anymore. It's just, not just in Australia, not just in Australia. You, the same thing, the same sense of a kind of sort of beige political class exists in, in France and Greece and uh, United States, you know. I mean, Obama was a great campaigner and he's done some good things as president, but he hasn't lived up to what he said he was going to be like, you know. In a way, his speeches were too good, almost. You know, they were too eloquent, they were too inspiring for what he was actually able to achieve. So what's changed? I don't know. I, I think it, it might be a gender thing, partly. I think it might be uh, somehow that... Uh, it's going to get woolly here, but there's something about... Um, uh, the way we live now with the sort of interling interlinked internet world that is about sort of networks of people rather than individuals being leaders. And, and this might be a good... I don't know what it is, Sue. I, I'm not sure. But whether those sort of... I mean, I, look, I, I think if we were invaded tomorrow, say, you know, Martians invade, you might get the great leader again, you know. But the issues have changed too. I think... That, yeah, agency is more spread. That's a that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Oppose and also it's a, there's a great book called The End of Power by Moses Naim. He's an American. He's actually Venezuelan, but he he, he's, he lives in America. And he he's got this great formulation about power. He says power is shifting in the world from you know west to east and from um, you know from from men to women. Like he's going on a long term. But he said power itself is also declining. Power is actually harder to... So his formulation is power is easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. And if you look at the way leaders are turned over these days in political parties, they're just, they're just recycled really fast. The, the average tenure of a, of a CEO of a top 500 company used to be seven years, now it's three and a half years. You know? That's, you know, that's changed. People are just... As soon as they're considered to be not... you know. Um, uh, doing the job, they're sacked, you know, and that there's a and and it's partly because pe a lot of people have voice now, and so it's really hard to push things through because everybody feels entitled. Everybody, you know, interest groups speak up, they oppose things, you know. It's it's very difficult. We are in. I, th I do think society is shifting in ways we don't really understand, and how to actually get things done because it's really hard to get things done in politics now. You know, there's a kind of impasse. You know, in 2012. I promise I won't drop statistics on you all night, but this one always uh, strikes me. Uh, of the 34 countries in the OECD, 30 had minority governments. 30. So every country was, in, was locked in this kind of impasse. You know? Australia had one. United States had one. Britain had one. You know? And so on it goes. Anyway, so something we'll see. We'll see how that unfolds. Right. <laughs> My name is Joe Kloss. I'd like to... Hi, Joe. I'd like you to throw your mind back to the time when Labour was in opposition for 16 years, hounded by the DLP, 
and by some of the clergy and bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. How did your father manage to survive that sort of um, period? It seemed to be pretty bloody hopeless. 23 years it was. 23. But 16. Oh, but, all right, fair enough. Yeah. But I thought it was 16, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Uh, Stand uh, corrected. Uh, 23 federally, anyway. And uh, um, uh, well, uh, I think they. Uh, look, he was addicted to politics, I think. You know, it, it, um, uh, at, at his funeral, Bill Hayden gave a eulogy and he said, Politics is like a raging incubus, and when, when it gets inside your bloodstream, you know, you just can't get it out. And I think he had that. I think he had it till my brother died. And I think when my brother died, that changed something for him. Um, and he, I think he lost a lot of his passion for politics at that point. Funnily enough, at the moment that he was about to do the most important job in it. Um, look, uh, and, and this in a way comes back to Sue's question. Those people who were trying to reform the Labor Party, they were out every night of the week. You know, we, they were at meetings every night, you know. And he's a really good dad, but we never saw him. You know, you know he, they were out or, you know, they were in his study plotting and so... And they were allowed to do that because it was much more patriarchal society. So the, the, the men went out and the women stayed at home and looked after the kids, you know. So the, the society was organised to enable men to pursue their visions of being great, you know, and that is no longer the case, thank God. <laughs> it, it wasn't a good system, um, but it, it did enable people to get a lot of things done in that sort of division of labour. The public was the male space and the private was the female space, and I think that sort of is one of the changes, actually. So how did he do it? I, he, just, he had a lot of perseverance, you know, but he believed the Labour Party was right, and he, they had this kind of faith, those guys, that if you, that if you can change the party, you can change the country. And it's still true. If you can change the Labor Party, we could change Australia. It's, 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 it's true. Um, because the Labor Party is the alternative to conservatism. It's not the Greens. It's not anything else. It's still the ALP for all its fault. You know? And if we're going to get a good response to, to climate change, it's, it's going to be the Labor Party who'll do it, nobody else. And so um, you know, I think uh, the Labor Party has to find a way to actually make itself kind of compelling again to, to not just to its small group that it does now, but to a much wider section of Australia. James, Sam Scholar, how are you? G'day, Sam. Um, I'm fascinated with leadership, and uh, I'm sure you know, in your work as a speechwriter and as a journalist that uh, you've observed many. Can you give me your impressions of the qualities of great leaders, mm. what leaders need, and probably the journey between a leader of the 70s and 80s and our modern day leader? Uh, yeah, really, that's a really good question. Um, uh, well, I, I, I do think a great leader does lift our horizons. I think that's really important, you know, that you, you never let the urgent overtake the important. You're always focused on, on, on the big, you know. Um, uh, so you've always got a goal, you know, and you don't actually waver from that goal. Um, uh, I think great leaders uh, have to be, uh, have to have, and this is the really hard thing in politics, is to understand the difference between a good compromise and a bad compromise. They have to be ready to make good compromises in pursuit of that larger goal while, while shunning crappy compromises just to, you know, to make things, you know, to make things work. They've got to be prepared to disappoint people. They've got to be honest. You know, and and uh, and I and I think a, a gift with words is vital. You know, if you look at those pe people like Whitlam and uh, not so much Hawke. Hawke didn't have a particular gift with 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 languages. He had a more intuitive, I think, way of being. Um, but Keating certainly certainly had it, and uh, um, you know, I could think of examples in in, in other countries. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's the long term. It's it's having a sense of, you know, this is where we need to be. You know, 
this is, you know, this is where we are now, this is where we need to go, and I've got a plan to go there, you know, and this is my plan, you know. And, and, and it's a kind of, and it comes back to speeches. I mean, the, the, the other thing that a leader has, it, it, the critical thing actually when I think about it is the relationship with the lead, you know. So, a, a, uh, you know, a, a great speech is always about the audience, you know. Um, Roosevelt began all his speeches with the words, my friends, you know. Um, you know, in, in Julius Caesar, um, Mark Antony says, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen. What's he doing there? He's saying, I'm one of you, you know. When, when Whitlam launched the policy in 1972, men and women of Australia, you know, those great, you know, resonant lines, he's saying, he's saying, forget ladies and gentlemen, forget all that old Australia. This is new Australia now. This is a different Australia, you know. But it's about the audience, do you see, you know. So... Um, uh, a guy called Hendrik Hertzberg, who wrote speeches for um, Jimmy Carter, he said, a great speech is about establishing a vocabulary of common feeling between the leader and the led. You know? And I think that's really important. You know? That sense of, I hear you. I understand what you think. You know? I may be about to tell you things that you don't like, but I know you. I see you. you know? I recognise you. I, the speaker. You know? I recognise the audience. You know? That's really important. Really important. Hi, James. Um, Jill. Hi, Jill. <coughs> Pardon me. Look, um, they say behind every great man is a great woman, and this is about good men. But I just wondered what um, you might like to say or not about the contribution of women to your life and to your father's life, if appropriate. Mm, sure. Wow. Well, <laughs> get some good questions here. Yeah. That's great, Jill. Um, well, um, uh, I've got a great mum to start. Um, she's 83 and still going strong. Um, uh, she, uh, one of those people who always just had endless reservoirs of energy and faith and belief in me. Um, uh, I'm married to a, a great woman called May Lamb. We have two... Um, two beautiful kids and the thing about May is that she um, uh, she uh, we, we we've been together now for 20 years and it, in the early periods of our life it, it wasn't always that easy actually the first five or ten years of our relationship were quite difficult but those hard years have made things so much better later you know and I, I said to her once that, you know, we, we'll be like two stones in the river. You know, the water will just rub us, you know, standing, but we'll, the water will sort of rub us smooth, you know. And it, it kind of has, you know. And it, it's better now f than it's ever been, you know. And that's because she's just a great person to talk to, you know, with, um, and a great, uh, just a great, um, she's a terrific editor, you know, of my work, you know, and we have wonderful conversations. And I edit her stuff too. She she writes things, um, I, I, and my dad. Well, the, this is the thing about dad. He he had a um, he, a marriage with my mum that didn't work out, and then he had a second marriage that didn't work out, and um, and then he had a th and but he as I said before, he always stayed really good friends with my mum, you know, and so that was very important to keeping us together as a family, even when we, there was a divorce, and and then um, he in the last ten years of his life, he had this fabulous relationship with a woman called Joan Joan Grant, and. Uh, he, I'm really very, very glad that he had that opportunity. She, she nearly died of meningococcal and went into coma for three weeks. And he found her in her flat, and uh, and he spent every week, every day, sitting by her bed, you know. And uh, something he'd never done. It had a kind of uh, a kind of staunch persistence and perseverance. Him just sitting there every day. That was a kind of, I think, a was a first for him, you know. And and she woke up unaffected one day miraculously you know and I think ever after that their relationship was always special after that you know and I still keep in close touch with Joan uh, she's a good friend and uh, so he sort of got it right in the end you know he got those 10 years you know? um, and you know you can have things like that happen late in life you know and that's and you're lucky I think if if, if that happens um, but you know um, like a lot of men I mean I 
women have just been completely central to my life. But I had no sisters, so I was always terrified of, you know, of meeting women until I got to university, basically. You know? So I went to a boys' school and I had no sisters. So, um, yeah, there's a little... I don't know if that's answering your question. James, it's George here. I was really interested with your comment that you said about that patriarchal society that Dad grew up in. Yeah. Did he feel compromised in the sense that so much of his time had been taken with the political movement of the Labor Party mm. to the detriment of you know family time? Did he accept it? Was he vexed by it, do you think? Um, no, George, I think he loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was like... You've got to understand... Um, <coughs> The Labor Party in those days was a really blokey institution. You know, it was more blokey than the Liberal Party was. You know, we, the Liberals elected their first MP in 1944, Labor 1974. You know, um, uh, it was you know it's because a union party. You know, and, and a blue collar industrial union party. Um, you know, the Labor tradition in Australia is very much that industrial working class. You know. Um, Changing by the 60s, you know, new unions coming in, white collar unions, um, but uh, that 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 were its that were its roots. And and in fact, um, Dad at an early uh, he'd, he'd be delegate to national conference, and he um, he stood up and he moved a motion, moved an amendment to a motion that was something about families, right? And he said this should include extended families. And uh, Kim Beasley Senior, so Kim's father, stood up and he said uh, he said. He said, I think what Senator Button is saying with this motion is that every red-blooded Australian man is going to have to live with their mother-in-law. <laughs> and, you know, this was acceptable. This sort of stuff was acceptable in the Labor Party, you know. And uh, so, you know, he, the, the interesting transformation of him was that he actually became, you know, he, had he lived, he would have been delighted that Julia Gillard became you know, Prime Minister. He would have been thrilled, you know. So the years had really mellowed, you know, mellowed him and made him... Um, you know, much much less sort of patriarchal, but um, he loved it. But he also he always you know there's a kind of thing if you get involved in the Labor Party, it's always love hate. You know, somebody once said about the LP that it means spending Tuesday nights with people that you hate rather than people you love. You know, and there's always that in the Labor Party. Um, uh, but but I, I what what is fascinating about the ALP is that it was a living institution in Australia. So women got in, joined the Labor Party and changed it. You know, they fought for their place. Um, they, they fought for affirmative action policies. Um, and as a result of like years of fighting to change the LP, we had a Rudd-Gillard government with lots of women in cabinet. Um, uh, Penny Wong and, and many of the, of the best, Nicola Roxon, Jenny Macklin, uh, Julia Gillard, Penny Wong, um, sorry? Uh, Tanya Plibersek, um, Kate Ellis, on it, on it goes. You know, really, really good performers. Much more than the libs. They've got one, you know, one tw- twenty-five. Non-partisan comment there. You know, but anyway. I'm waiting for hope to return. Jamie is from the year nine students. Hi, Jamie. Hi. I was just going to ask. Um, this is mainly focusing more on your writing side, but. What to you is the most important thing you've ever written? Like, not necessarily writing for prime ministers or something, but personally, like, what do you believe is like your most important piece of writing? Ah, uh, look, Jamie, Jamie, yeah, probably those chapters on my father in the book and and my brother are the most important. Um, um, and in journalism, was that article that that young girl? Did yeah. Uh, yeah, mm. that that was yeah yeah. I I I once wrote a piece, so I uh, I once wrote a piece about a young woman who was unemployed. It was about 1997. The unemployment was pretty high, and uh, um, I spent a week with her, and she looked for like every day she went out looking for work, and uh, and <coughs> when I went to her house in Craigieburn, she thought I was coming for a 20 minute interview, and I stayed all week. And uh, she, um, and, and after about day three, she said, "What are you going, or are you just going to stay here?" You know. But the thing was, I wanted to stay because I wanted to get um, sort of detail of her life. You know, and, and I learnt, for example, that uh, every day, she, you know, when she went for job interviews, she'd take the train from Craigieburn into Flinders Street. It's a really long journey. And by the time she got to Flinders Street, her hair would be mussed up. So she'd go into the horrible toilets of Flinders Street, and she'd have, you know, she'd use the dryer to try and get her hair into place, and. 
she, and and she always had these rules like never to drink coffee before an interview because it might smell on her breath and never to drink coke because it might make her burp and um and and she was she wanted a job so much you know she just so it was a time you know it's the kind of piece about the the myth of doll bludgers you know and uh, uh i wrote all this down i wrote the piece and i sent it to her uh, before I published it, and she hated it. She said, you've made me out to be a loser, you know. Um, and I didn't think that was the case. And I said, well, I'm, look, you know. And anyway, it published. It, was, it ran. And uh, within two days, she got offered a job. Uh, she got offered a, probably five or six jobs, and she took one of the jobs. And um, 17 years later, she's still working in that job, you know. And, and she's, she got married and had kids, you know. And I think getting that job sort of turned her life around somehow, you know. So I'm, I'm very proud of that because it's only one person, but it had a, I think that article had a big impact on her life, you know. Um, a huge subject, but I wrote a lot about the whole question of Islam, Muslims, terrorism. Um, well, I was in the UK and I really wrestled with those issues, so that was a big thing for me. Read, as I said before, read, read everything, Jamie. Read the best writers you can find. You know, ask people who the best writers are and read them. Um, write, you know, write all the time. Keep a diary. Try and get, get things published. Yeah, get it out. Yeah, get, it doesn't matter where you get published. Just get it published. Um, do you still have your publication, Bruno? Yeah. Your article. That one is in our last. Edition. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. yeah. What else? Um, and watch, you know, just watch, watch people. We're most interested in people, you know, in the world, and just watch what people do and how they behave, and, and, and write it down. Keep a notebook. Keep, notebook. Yeah, keep it. Keep a notebook. Yeah. Can Jamie send you a piece of his writing? Sure, he you can. Hey, listen, you can, you can. There's a great website. There's a great website called Brain Pickings. Does anybody know the website Brain Pickings? Do you like it? I love it too. Yeah, and yeah, it is, isn't it? And there's some great tips on brain pickings. And brain pickings is um, a website run by a woman in New York called Maria Popova. She actually came to the Writers' Festival last year in Melbourne. I didn't go. But uh, she, she spends her whole day reading stuff for this website. And she lives off the website. But there's just fantastic stuff. And she, you know, this writer on how to write, you know, Scott Fitzgerald's letter to his son about why his, his piece of writing wasn't very good and how he could improve it and... So that's something. Have a look at that at that site. Last question here. This is just a comment, really. I was really interested in what you were saying about a good journalist being a people watcher, and I think one of the first things I turned to at the weekend is Tony Wright. I think he says some really significant yep. stuff mm. at, at his level of family. He talks about his family and. Yeah. And the other one is probably Martin Flanagan, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, they're two good people to read. Yeah, yeah. Tony's writing about politics, obviously, yes. and uh, uh, he's great, you know. And and um, and, <laughs> and 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 Martin writes about so much different stuff. <laughs> Has written beautifully for for many many years, and uh, and his brother doesn't write badly either, actually. <laughs> you know, so. You might yeah. Get yeah. Get Richard Flanagan out. We <laughs> Of course. I reckon they've not heard your book, and, and the book bonding people are here from Brisbane. Do do buy the book after. Um, will you read a bit? Sure. Is this what you want me? This bit here? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So this is um, this is a, a chapter about. Uh, it actually goes in, sort of goes back into the things we've discussed tonight, um, but it starts here. Uh, I spent a lot of nights in Canberra on my own. If I worked back late, I would leave the office in time to catch the 1014 bus, which passed the department on its long haul to Red Hill. It flew around the bend near Old Parliament House and loomed at the traffic lights beside the department, an illuminated ghost ship pushing through an ocean of darkness. The driver nodded and grinned, but never spoke, nor did the scatter of passengers. Were any of us alive? I like that mute driver. If he saw me running late, he would bring his bus to a screeching halt, even if he'd passed his stop. 
Thanks, mate, I'd say, to break the silence. The next and last bus didn't come for an hour. On other nights, to stretch my legs after a long day at the screen, I would walk from the department to Red Hill, an hour's journey or more. After Monica, streetlights were rare, and as I climbed the hill, the blackness sometimes unnerved me. I would phone someone just to hear a human voice. The great Australian silence is not only in the desert and bush, it reaches into the heart of the capital. Sometimes the only living things I saw were kangaroos who had come off the hill to steal some lawn and who stood up from their chewing to stare at me like a gang of street toughs, the muggers of Muggerway. I walked around Red Hill as the sun came up and across Lake Burley Griffin in the evenings, leaning into the wind. At lunch I, stro I strolled to Old Parliament House where I studied the portraits of Prime Ministers in King's Hall and wondered at the cupboard-sized apartment for the PM's two speechwriters. What sense of warmth, mischief, conspiracy and consequence it must have created to pack the whole parliament into these tiny rooms. Poking around this place, with its radios embedded in walls, piles of newspapers and panelled wood, it occurred to me that I had reached an age where I had less allegiance to the future than to the past. In the deep red senate chamber, I told the attendant that my father had spent many years here. Ah yes, he was a good man, he said. Lowering his voice, he gestured past the barrier cord towards the front benches. Do you want to step in and have a look? I said no, feeling awkward at being offered this privilege. Yet I think I was always looking for my father in this house and this city that claimed him when I was young. Beautiful. Mr James Button. <laughs> That's the book you've got to buy. Go to the bookshop at the back there, buy a few copies. James is going to hang around. One last question, James. Are you buoyed by this? 40 people in a room who still want to talk, who still care about writing, who still want to explore social issues, who still want to look each other in the eye? Yeah? I, I, yeah, certainly I am. It's yeah? great to be here. I know that's no. a Dorothy Dixon. No, no, but, but it, it's <laughs> like, you know, the thing about Bruno is you can never say no to Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> and you should set your sights higher, Bruno. You should go, for, because nobody's going to be able to say no to you. you know? and, and the reason why Paul can't say no is because he, he runs wonderful events and, uh, and he has wonderful audiences. Always engaged audiences. Um, yeah, it's fabulous to be here. And I hope to come back. Thank you for having me. And Victor Serge said writing should be a testimony to the vast flow of life through us. Yeah. You think he's on the money? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Again. Should be a testimony to the vast flow of life through us. That's fantastic. Isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, no, no, men and women of Australia. I'm going to rise to Goff's height, I think, and that would be good. Men and women of Australia, Mr James Button. Could I thank Alan for doing all the sound? Could I thank um, Charlie for doing the door? Could I thank our friends from the local winery, Peter and... Robin, sorry, Robin, I've had your name there our young people photographing too, and you wonderful audience. And we've had this as a free event. We can't do it all the time, but um, come back next year too. Buy the book and come and get James to sign it for you. <laughs>